Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show for your Tuesday Trivia Taco Tuesday afternoon. Hope you all had a great session out there. A little bit of a pullback for some of our things we've been talking about. Silver pullback. We had some Bitcoin pullback. It's okay. Grand scheme of things, we'll be doing fine. I'll look at that after uh, we get through the topic du jour. The topic I wanted to get to to start things off was this one right here. Is ARM about to crash? So just to, to kind of set that stage, um, you don't have to answer this poll right away, but I'm going to start this poll, and then I'm going to show you guys the charts here and see what you think. So this is the chart of ARM since its IPO in October, or sorry, September of last year. It's been a phenomenal run. Things have been just ripping to the upside, and, you know, well, it does look like a beautiful chart. It has rolled over a little bit over the past couple of weeks, but I'm uh, just curious to get your take at this point based off just that. Now, I'm gonna show you a whole lot of other information here. What I wanted to do is just kind of at first glance, if we look at the price chart, you know, is this thing about to crash? What do you think? So I know we don't have everybody here yet because many of you are showing up late, that's okay. Uh, but fill out that poll for me because I do wanna close that one and then dive into some explanations, some details and things which may um, open up some perspective to this one, which is very different than what you may be seeing on mainstream media. So is it about to crash? Yes or no? I'm going to end that poll. Oh, right about now. Um, oh, oh, you guys are still popping in there. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. I love it. I'm watching the statistics change as we speak. So I will just keep it right there for a minute or so uh, to let you guys send it in. All right. That's it. It's done. I'm going to get that poll out of there. End it. Wow. All right, I don't know how many people were in the poll. Um, only 10 of you. Only 10 of you voted. It's okay. I'll, I will let you guys off the hook this time. So it was 50-50. Half of you saying, yeah, I'm about to crash. Half of you saying, no. There should have been another box there, right? We said, I don't really care. Or who knows? Okay, so we did this one. It's still 50%. Now that Liz and John send in their yes and no, we're still at 50%. <laughs> We did an arm show a couple weeks back. It's maybe months at this point because my memory just kind of loses track. Um, but we did a show on this one, Lori, where we talked about arm and what it represents kind of as a technology. So right now, what you do is you buy a processor and the system is built around that. So you buy your Intel, your AMD chip, and everything in your computer is built around that chip and its capabilities. Arm, and, and when you do that, Depending on what your application is, let's say you buy this Intel chip for, let's say I buy this because I want to stream, I want to do a live broadcast show every day. So I find a chip that's kind of more for that, right? The performance numbers. But then once I build my computer, I may actually have resources in my computer that don't need to be, that aren't being used, that are just a waste of space. Yet the, the processor, the chipset that I'm using is going to run those processes anyway because it runs everything. And what, what ARM represented, at least from my understanding of the project was, it's no longer a buy our AMD chip, buy our Intel chip, <coughs> and just build your system around what we offer. Instead, it's saying, what do you want this process to do? Right? What, what systems are you putting in place? And ARM, this company out of the UK, which did an IPO back in September, will come in and say, all right, we will design for you kind of an optimal style chipset configuration and license you that technology, license you those, and you can go manufacture those and print it. So let's say I am a company that wants to produce high-end cards for specifically streaming live shows on the internet. Well, AMD may not be the right choice, but I could go out to ARM, have them custom design a chipset, find a builder to compile all of that, hopefully have a software developer too, and now I have something that doesn't waste system resources. If it's not focused at the streaming aspect or resources that I need, it doesn't get implemented, therefore saving energy, space, time, heat, all that stuff. So it was a very interesting model and obviously well received because the chart for ARM, if we go off of its uh, initial opening price, which was $56.10, it currently is up 130% in less than a year. So I think we could all agree this thing has been very well received. Now, here's the other question I have for you guys. As you know, I am not a fan of IPOs. I think IPOs are a pump and dump, not a scam, but a pump and dump frenzy. Remember, the process is this. If I'm ARM, uh, the company ARM, and I want to go public, 
I go and I find an underwriter. So I go to a Goldman Sachs, a BlackRock, some big firm out there and say, hey, we want to go public. And Goldman, okay, great. And they start that whole process. Now Goldman's getting a big chunk of the action. And because of that, it's in Goldman's best interest to get the highest price possible per share at the IPO. So what they do is they do a roadshow and they start promoting arm, arm, arm. They're out there running ads and banners and trying to hype up and get CNBC, Fox, Bloomberg. The best thing yet, get Jim Cramer to tell the sheeple, buy arm, it's gonna be the best thing ever. And you do this huge marketing hoopla campaign to get everyone excited. And some of you that were around, you might remember the uh, euphoria that was around this IPO when it came out. I mean, it was set to be one of the biggest IPOs. Everyone was just, oh my God, arm, arm, arm. Most people didn't know what the hell it did. So once the IPO date arrives, and on this specific one, I'll show you the calendar, or I'll show you the, the chart here. The IPO date was officially September 14th of 2023. Up until that point, they're constantly adjusting, here's what the IPO price should be. They'll give you an estimate, like uh, this is what we think it's going to be. The first trading price doesn't necessarily have to be at that number. It could be much higher, it could be much lower. So for everybody out there, the first trade was $56.10, but that was not the IPO price. What was the IPO price for ARM? What do you think? Do you think it was higher than 56 or lower than 56? Or even put a number if you want. Right? It, again, it opened up that day at $56.10, went much higher for the next two days, and then you can see the roller coaster ride from there. But what do you think? Do you think that the IPO price was lower than that or higher than $56.10? Now, as I stall here, I'm going to actually type in that number and put it on your screen. So this red horizontal line here represents what all the analysts, all the underwriters, and the company thought their valuation would be. And that was probably at a higher price than normal. They Because it was so excited. People were so excited about this. They kept raising this forecast. Well, $51 is what the IPO price was supposed to be. Meaning, this is what we think it's worth. Mind you, $51 is our number. It opened up at $56.10. So already that day, if you bought it on the open there, you were paying a... 8% premium just to buy it at, at an already elevated price. Within two days, it was already 34% higher than what analysts and all the underwriters had said it's worth. Remember, they've already given it a high forecast. So this is, you know, those first two days, it was 34 34% higher than its IPO price. In my opinion, it's probably 50 to 60% higher than what its IPO, uh, IPO price should be. No problem, Tomasina. All good. I know you, you know, you know what I meant. So I'm setting the stage here by creating this, this understanding the, the game of the finance and trading world, create hype, get you all excited, give it an IPO price. Hopefully it gets higher than that. In this case, it definitely did. Now from the IPO price, we are officially 150, well, it's gotta be there. Not right, these lines might be slightly off. There we go. Uh, according to, from where it opened that day on September 14th, uh, it's up 131% from its expected IPO price, 154%. So my opinion in just that short window of time, I would say this thing is pretty damn overbought. Tom says, if you bought all the arm stock now and use the earnings to pay for the stock, you'd break even by the year 2036, 24 AD. All right. I haven't, I haven't done those kind of calculations, but Tom being the engineer, of course, he looked at those numbers. So based off of that, my gut says it's slightly overbought. Okay, but that's not why I did the show with this topic here today, right? The topic is, is it about to crash? Now, we all know that stocks can continue on up here, and as long as they're developing and delivering on their, their promises and creating goods and services for people to consume and being a leader in that industry, this could go much, 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 much higher. However, I did a show for you based off someone's question the other day asking about, could you talk about shares outstanding versus the float? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And one of the big red flags I showed you, not just with stocks, but also with cryptocurrencies and digital assets is make sure that your float and your outstanding shares are relatively close. Make sure that there's not a huge disparity there between it, right? We looked at Apple, and I forgot the exact numbers, but there was maybe a, a 100 million shares difference out of billions. No big deal, right? So let me show you this one of ARM. So 
So here's Arm Holdings, currently up in the after hours. It's, it was up 2.18% today, looking good. I'm going to scroll down here and go to our shares outstanding. Notice 1 billion shares outstanding. 1.03 billion to be precise, right? Okay, that, that's neither a lot nor a little. It doesn't matter how many shares are outstanding because it's a combination of price and shares outstanding that really matter. But notice right below it, float. You have 96 million out of 1.3 billion are available for you to buy and sell. So now, the reason I did this is this to me is a scary proposition. You have 90% of all of the shares are held by SoftBank. They're not public. They're not out there for you right now. They're under a lockup period. There was a lockup period where insiders and specific individuals, typically board members, executives, etc., cannot sell their shares. So let's say as of last Friday, the stock goes up 5,000% in a day. 5,000% a day. It's like the biggest gain in the history of mankind in one day. None of those initial owners, the CEOs or whomever that were under that IPO, they can't sell their shares. Doesn't matter what happens, they cannot sell their shares. However, as of today, these insiders can now sell their shares. And as Big Eb said, he says, doesn't SoftBank have a big position in ARM? They own 90%. 9.6% are um, currently available to everybody else, which leaves about 3.4% that's in the hands of um, people who are liquid. So to me, this is what I'm, I'm just going, oh my God. Because imagine you invest in this IPO early on. You were way early. You got in on, you're probably in it, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 bucks per share. It's now up in the hundreds, right? I don't know about you, but I know if it was me, and let's say I had a thousand shares of this, I'm probably gonna sell 500. I'm selling half my position, locking in some profits and calling it a day. And the fact that over 90% of these shares are not even on the market yet, what happens when these people start to sell? Okay, so let me just real quick do some math for you. Yeah, Big Eb, 90%. So you guys see here it says float 96 million shares, right? Uh, if you want, I can bring up that calculator just so you can see it. We'll do 96, 96, uh, 380. That's 96 million. If I divide that by the number of shares currently out there, or sorry, shares outstanding, which is 1.03 billion. There we go. What you're looking at is 9.35%. So 9.35% of shares right now is all that you and I can buy. If you wanted to buy every single share outstanding, you could only, or every share available, you could only buy 9.35%. That means that guaranteed 90 plus percent are sitting somewhere else, unavailable. Now, when those come to market, think of how quickly this could have an impact because there's only 96 million shares out there. But what if 96 million shares come on the market tomorrow? Let's say that this float doubles. You guys tell me the simple math here. If there's currently 96 million shares available and price is trading at 120 let's call it 130 dollars then what should happen if all of a sudden tomorrow these insiders sell 96 million shares meaning it's now put into the marketplace and becomes part of the flow what should happen to that share price uh market says some of these penny stock traders like a low float because these stocks can move quick and dangerous yep exactly it's it's gambling it's way too risky all right so what do you guys think would happen to this price if all of a sudden the same amount, 96 million, so the number of shares in the open market doubled. Not only would it nosedive, Liz, it's simple math. If price, if demand stayed exactly the same and supply doubled, then your share price would be cut in half. So literally in, in one day, this could drop to 65 bucks, assuming no new demand came into the marketplace. And you have hundreds of millions of shares that are just waiting to be sold. So, you know, I'm looking at this one and I'm not, I'm not, calling and saying it's going to you know plummet right now but you notice the um, short interest is extremely low on this one i think what you're going to see over the next couple days to a couple weeks is all of a sudden you're going to see insiders starting to liquidate their portfolio and not liquidate but just cash out of some take some profit on those positions and that could mean that a few million trickle out Let, let's um 
I'm not sure how quick they are to do these statistical changes, but I'm gonna put a note on my computer here. Oh, do I have a post-it right here? I don't, but I'm gonna write down the shares outstand, the float. Uh, let's see, what, no, what does it say for eight here in small print? Eight, a company's float, okay. Doesn't tell me when it's updated. But right now the float is 96.38 million and today is 312. I'm gonna watch this over the next 30 days or so. And this number should start to increase significantly, which means more supply is coming onto the market. Therefore, the only way that this thing can continue on up is if demand exceeds supply. So either you're gonna to start to hear about all these amazing stories about ARM and how great they're doing, mostly perpetrated by the industry to get you to push, to continue to buy it, or this thing is going to come down in a big way because you have extremely low float it's already shot up because people were trying to buy ARM because of the hype, but they didn't know there was little float. And now 90 plus percent of the shares are just sitting there that can now be sold on the open market. In my opinion, I think ARM is about to crash. Now, does that mean it's going to go to zero? Absolutely not. Remember, their valuation was based off of $51 per share. Could it get down to 51? Absolutely. I think right now, personally though, I think that there's too much hype in the industry to get ARM to tank that much. However, could we see ARM in a very short window of time close this gap and all of a sudden it's down at 77, 76 bucks? Yeah, uh, I, actually, I do think that that is a very high possibility. Again, it really depends on what these insiders do. With SoftBank owning 90% of the company, um, that, that's a, a big red flag. You know, SoftBank obviously wants to make money on this and maybe they think they'll hold on to it longer. But as a risk manager, they have to know that holding 90% of this is a dangerous proposition. What should they do? They should liquidate some of that, maybe 10%, 20%. Remember, if, if SoftBank does the right thing, which is risk management, say, let's sell 10% of our position. Let's just scale it down. Then that's going to put 90 million shares in the market. <laughs> so... I mean, you've already got a, a crazy situation. Actually, it'll put 100 million shares, which is more than the current supply. So it's in this weird conundrum here of all these insiders are going to want to sell, but they've got to know they're going to put downward pressure on this market. So Joe says, I'm thinking of shorting it. I am thinking of shorting it. Uh, I was looking at it today and I did not pull the trigger there. Um, hold on, I'll get to that in a second. Um, I didn't pull the trigger on it, but I, I do think you'll start to see it slowly drift down. So I haven't quite made the decision whether I want to go um, buy kind of longer term puts or sell puts on this one. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, Tom says, saying that ARM will crash is implying th those held shares exist but have no value. Well, they obviously they have value, but when you throw those onto the market and you make that part of the overall supply, you're increasing supply. They, of course, have value. I mean, ARM is not a, for at least from my understanding, it's not a, a scam. It's not a junk company, but uh, it certainly will push those prices down. Those shares exist and already have value. Correct, they do. And that's part of their market cap, right? If the market capitalization is not going to change. The market cap will remain the same. The market cap is not based off of float. It's based off of shares outstanding. The issue is all those shares coming into the marketplace are going... See, it's easy to drive something up. Like if I, if I started a publicly traded company and I kept 90% of all the shares for me, but I just put 10% out there for the public and then I do a huge hype marketing campaign, most people won't think about, oh, let's look at shares outstanding compared to price, right? They're just going, I want to buy some of this. So you go to your E-Trade and you buy 100 shares or 1,000 shares and you just buy it. Oh, this looks like a good price. I don't know, it's new. What they're not taking into account is if those other nine uh if those other 990 million shares were part of the float price would not have moved up like it did here it would not have had that surge because there just wasn't demand there all right june 21st 100 puts huh uh, that might not be bad june let's see we got april may june mm. that actually might not be a bad bad go there um, maybe I'll just do one with the show just for fun, just so you guys can see it. But I haven't quite figured out exactly what prices I want. But, you know, in looking at it, it does seem ripe for uh, a pullback here. And it, it could be dramatic depending on how much of that insider float gets closed up. Like this gap here between, let me show it to you. This gap between float and outstanding, sh uh, outstanding shares should close. 
Uh, for most of the big publicly traded companies on U.S. markets, when you bring up this info, especially for the big ones, that, that, that they're almost the same number. Yes, they're slightly different, but not this colossally different, right? This is um, way out of line in my opinion. So anyway, I just thought I would share that one with you guys. It's something that uh, I've been watching, and I like the company. Don't get me wrong. I like ARM. I love the, the concept. But I think at this point, knowing that there's this much liquidity about to come into the market and people are going to take some profits, that does shift the balance of probability to, to the downside, in my opinion. Okay? So there. Finish that one. Is ARM about to crash? Well, in my mind, crash is a subject one. I think it's about to have a pullback. You know, could it drop 10, 15, 20%? Yeah, I think it absolutely could. And I, and I think it probably will. More than 20%. Let me, let me bring up the chart here and we'll map out what those numbers are. From current levels, 20% would bring you down just to barely even close in that gap. And that, that gets you to uh, about 103. To get to that 100 mark that you mentioned there, Big Ab. And, you know, this is the tricky part is I don't know how to calculate this. Maybe one of you guys do. If you look at um, the put side, clearly the market makers who are the ones making the markets for these, these options, they know this. So my guess is that the premium has surged on puts for uh, ARM in the last, call it 30 days. Why? Because this was a very clear event. Everybody knew that, that extra, the uh, unlocking period was coming, which is why I have this wonderful graphic of a little cage and a key. Yeah, those, uh, those shares have now been unlocked. Um, I did not mention the percentage of shares held by institution. Um, we can look up that one. You can see right here, only 8.18% and 90% held by insiders. Well, that's misleading in my mind because SoftBank is the insider, but they're also, SoftBank's an institution in my opinion. I don't know. That's a gray area there. But um, right now, 90% of it is still held by SoftBank. Uh, I'm looking further out, but I guess did your financial advice. <laughs> uh, well, hey, again, guys, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying to go out there and short it. I just think it's an interesting play and something to think about. Uh, if you are, I would buy puts out of the money. I, I wouldn't do it at the money. I would go way out. Um, and, and the main reason I would go way out is if... If we have a billion shares and the flow was 500 million, that gap, that the amount that looks to be coming onto the market, it's still significant, but it's not as dramatic. This has a colossal gap between float and outstanding shares. I mean, that, that one of the larger ones I've seen, even with VinFast, which is, you know, uh, VFS, we, we talked about that one. Let me just bring it up here. This one also has just a, a drop in the bucket is public versus the outstanding shares. And... I would argue that, that ARM is a much more, actually, no, this is pretty bad. <laughs> this, is, this is way worse, sorry. This has 2 billion shares, 2.3 billion shares outstanding, only 40 million uh, float. Yeah, this, is, this one's nuts. So, you know, maybe you want to find out when the VFS unlock period is, but I don't think VinFast has had the, the industry excitement that ARM has had. Oh. Hey, good to see you, Pepe. Um, so there you go. That's that's that. Let me shift gears a little bit here. Um, I'm going to go to one listener question, and then I will jump into our topic, or at least covering our markets. Uh, Todd says, I've been wheel trading SLV at 19 to 21.50 levels. I'm reluctant to sell puts higher than 21.50 area. Am I silly? I mean, I don't know if you're necessarily silly. Uh, let's bring up the chart here. I mean, in my mind, I think silver is going higher. I do think that you saw the inflation number today was a little bit hotter than uh, it's been heating up a little bit, which comes as no surprise to myself. And I think that that is going to continue uh, slightly higher inflation. I don't think we're going to surge, but I think it's going to be slightly higher. That should push um, metals, gold, silver, et cetera, higher. But if we look at the price chart of silver, it, it's not that great, right? It's just been kind of stuck in this really slightly downtrending range since April of last year. You know, my um, my call options against my silver are at 2250 for some of them. The rest of it's at 23 bucks. So I think I'll be fine by Friday. But to Todd's question, you know, am I silly to sell the 2150s? Which let me let me get rid of some of the lines here. Uh, I'll move this down to 2150. It's this bottom red line here. Do, do, do. You, are you silly to do it there? No, I, w I wouldn't know if I would call you silly. I think it just depends on what your expectations are for silver, right? If you think it's going to continue on to the upside, then 2150 should be a no-brainer. Um, if you wanted to stay at your, your 21s or your 2050s right down here, 
you're not going to get much premium. You get a couple of cents, but it's not. you're not going to make any money on that one. So if you thought that silver was ready for a correction, then I would wait and look to sell maybe the 2050s, buy some directional puts if you wanted to. Um, otherwise, I would, I'd be fine with the 2150s. Personally, I'm okay with that. Um, I have enough silver at this point, so I'm not going to be selling any puts on them. Uh, no, nothing yet unless I get taken out of some of my position here, which I may, I may do soon. <laughs> yeah, Big Ev, I need to put a disclaimer on this show. I know, I know. Margaret says, I would say you're safe. Yeah, I mean, I don't see silver imploding, um, but it has had a pretty big correction. And if you look at, you know, there's a lot of people that love to bring up Fibonacci retracements and say, all right, from the move that started here to where we peaked out at, a Fib retracement was bring us back to 2145, a 50% retracement. So I think you're okay um, going for that, that level. So yeah, I'd be fine at 2150. And it's not silly. It really is just a matter of how comfortable you are if you got assigned at 2150, right? If you're doing the wheel strategy, I think you're fine with it. Because if you get assigned at 2150 and it, it stays at 2150, well then sell the calls at 22 and collect some better premium or 2250. Uh, if you believe it's going to be trending up, that's the keys. You have to have that, um, the general idea that's going to be moving up, down or sideways to be selling or buying puts options here. If you're going way out of the money, um, would you buy puts one, two or three months? I would do, I would do three. I would buy as much time as possible. You're going to pay a lot more money for those if you're buying directionally. But yeah, if I'm going on something like this, which is pure speculation, I don't expect them to start dumping right away. It's not like, oh, the day's here, they're all going to unload. There needs to be a strategy on the part of SoftBank and any other insider here. The real question is, what is SoftBank going to do? Uh, I have not looked at SoftBank as far as their historical track record of what do they do on these types of situations. Are they historically uh, big sellers right away? Do they pawn off shares in acquisition of other companies? How does, it, how does it function for SoftBank? That I don't know. So I would buy myself some time. Okay, let's go to our top eight here. Worst performer today, oh, Bitcoin, oh, no. Well, it's not that bad. I mean, again, it is just going gangbusters. I'm loving it, still feeling pretty confident about it. Uh, we are currently on the futures market at $71,800, slide of 1.8% today, but well off the lows. I mean, you notice the chart here. It, it seems like every time Bitcoin has a sell-off, it just comes bouncing right back. So I'm not worried about it. You saw this nice aggressive sell-off here, and all of a sudden, boom, just came pushing right back in. The thing I'm really excited about is you look at this BTO, or uh, uh, IBIT, not BT, IBIT, and look at this on a daily time frame with some volume at the bottom. You know, the great news is volume is staying really high. That means demand is still strong for this ETF. There's a lot of transaction going on. That that's one of the big drivers here. Volume increasing for this one. Um, it is now Bitcoin is now the seventh largest asset class in the world. It has passed silver, so it's pretty. Pretty phenomenal um, what's just happened in a short period of time. And again, the way that this had a big red candle here today on IBIT, but pushed, it's still red, but nowhere near as big as it was earlier on, which tells you that people are buying dips. They're going with that trend, buying dips on this one. So, you know, even though it's down 1.8%, I could care less. I, I'm fine. Again, I'm waiting another year anyway before I even consider selling. So, looks good to me. We did have a pullback in gold today. Of course, if you trade candlestick patterns, the, the strategy would have been a low below yesterday's candle as a short opportunity. It looked pretty nice today. We were due for a pullback. Definitely due for a pullback on gold's price. The question is, where do we pull back to? I had a friend ask me today if I if I think we're going to drop back down to this breakout range. I don't I don't think we'll get down to that you know 2100 level. Um, that's you know we could, but I don't see anything in here that really screams at me that there's a, a demand zone. There's nothing on this chart that screams and says, this is the best place to be um, buying on a pullback. If anything, I'd be looking at maybe this 2140 mark. Um, it's about as, as close as I'm going to get to buying that pullback. I don't need any more gold. I, I've got a little bit, but uh, my exposure to gold and silver, I think at this point is sufficient. So I will be leaving that one alone, but I do think you'll see a little bit of a pullback here. It was, it was due. It was about time. You just took all the nice volume coming into gold as well. Crude oil down 0.4%. Drifting lower, even though it had that uh, little tiny green candle yesterday, it looked like it wanted to rebound. We didn't really today. You had a nice green candle today at one point, finishing red near the lows of the day. But technically, I don't see anything here to be concerned about. Um, you know, if we start, if we break these lows below 76, then I think you got to shift back towards the short side here on crude oil. Other than that, I still think you got a higher highs, higher lows going on for crude oil. Russell 2000 was down 0.16%. Well, man, great shooting star 
well, ish pattern on Friday of last week, but getting a little bit of follow through today still feels strong to me. Um, someone might call this a double top now. Well, we really won't know that's a double top till it drops down below 1900. And honestly, I'm not waiting 200 points to call that a double top. There's plenty of trades to be done in between now and then. Uh, where would that be? Probably once it starts to break either this 23, or sorry, 2038 line or getting below the lows that we achieved today, which is 2050. If you close below 2050, then you might have a little bit of a short opportunity. But again, it's been making higher highs and higher lows ever since uh, the beginning of the year. So all in all, looking okay. All right, we did have the hook. Captain Hook showed up. Two days in a row of nice up moves for that 10-year. Of course, right now it's showing a red candle. But on the day, your 10-year yield was up 1.29%, bringing us to 4.151. Again, still historically low. Um, still historically low. However, that trend has been in place since December of last year with kind of higher highs, higher lows. So I, I still feel like we're going to be going higher on the yield, especially when you take a look at that yield curve, which we talked about so much this inversion is just it's got to normalize at some point and right now the the talk is that we're not going to cut rates at the next meeting most likely i agree with that uh it'll probably be july uh september meetings where we really start to see some cuts if the economy can prove to us that it's actually back on its feet so that yield curve the only way this is going to get fixed is that long end starts to tick back up and i think that's i've been saying that's what i think is going to happen and just hasn't come to fruition dollar index Slightly up on the day, but still big picture shows you chop sideways action. You had a hammer formation on Friday, which is the inverse of what the equity markets did. Two days of follow through here looking pretty darn good. That's great. Um, can you highlight the shooting star pattern? Sure. Let's go back to... Uh, it's this guy. Right? It's... Uh, let's see. Highlight it. Do, 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 do. That one. Oh, of course, it's a red highlighter. That doesn't really help you much, does it? It's that, that peak candle. Oh, great. Now I can't erase the damn thing. <laughs> How do I get rid of this stupid thing? All right. It's not letting me delete it. I'll, I'll just get out of that one. And Where's my eraser? All right. Well, great. There it is. It's permanently highlighted now. There you go, Brandon. That's the shooting star I was looking at. The bottom's not there. The bottom is up there. Oh, good. I can get rid of it now. There we go drawn too many things on my chart there. okay uh podium time we did we did the dollar index again it's been drifting down but a little bit of hook over the past couple days it went deeper than i thought it was going to remember we talked about hitting that 103 mark that was kind of my stopping point i thought we'd we'd base it 103 we went all the way down well past that uh to a low point of 102.35 so <laughs> yeah 102.35 and now we're starting to tick back up so i I don't really have anything to say about the dollar index. Notice it's just this higher highs and then a higher low, lower high, lower, uh, higher low. So it feels like it's just consolidating right now and kind of compressing uh, from the big picture that it's been bouncing since July of last year. So, I, you know, where is it going to go here? Probably up to 104, but I don't see any real momentum in that dollar index right now. All right. That was your bronze medal. Silver medal goes to the S&P 500. Not sure why we had that line drawn there, but I'll get rid of it. We had that, um, which you guys are giving me a hard time saying it's not a shooting star. And I said, I agree with you. That was from Friday's session. It was more of a, a shooting comment because the, the real body on Friday's candle for the S&P futures was way too big. But it did pose a, an interesting short trade because of the, the setup and momentum. And we did get that follow through on Monday's session, although today just recouped it and rallied to an all-time intraday uh, clo or all-time closing high for the S&P today at 54.21. I think, don't I have Scott McCormick's forecast on here? And yeah, that's his up there. Sixth, I think that was Scott's at 61.20, I believe was what his number was. So we got a long way to go to get to there. But uh, again, I talked about not really worrying until we break some of these most recent demand zones. And we just, S&P has not. It was 1.07% gain today. And then you look at the, the NASDAQ, that was also, okay, if we start breaking some of these levels, particularly this 17,830, then maybe we start thinking about you know closing long positions or opening some shorts, but we never got there. So we'll see here uh, going forward. Does this next step up? Does this next pivot or swing at 18.138? Does that hold that? And uh, now we're off to all-time highs yet again. So we're we're not at an all-time um, intraday high, but we are at an all-time closing high for the Nasdaq today, finishing at 18,477. 
Uh, good, good news are good news. Bad news are good news. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it does feel that way, Andres, where it's like everything just seems to be pushing these markets higher. And, you know, the big the big talk track is, of course, the economic data. I think that's your big piece for right now. And I'll bring that one up for you so we can look at the numbers that came out today. Yeah, 30 percent tax or miners for all coins held by them. Just bad news. Yeah, that was bad. Oh, you asked you asked me about the miners here a second ago. Yeah, the, the tax thing obviously would be a big hit. He proposed. I don't think that that's going to get passed. You get a lot of opposition there. I think that would be very bad for crypto. Um, but you know some of these miners taking on the chin, man. Whew. You know, last couple of days, actually, last couple of weeks have been pretty aggressive. Marathon from its opening price on Wednesday, the 28th, to where we close today, down 37%. And Riot is not going to look much different uh, from that same period of time. Riot is down 35.8%. So you know, there's a couple factors here. I've already spoken to you guys about why I think the miners are going to have a real world of hurt starting March, uh, May 1st. Once the halving happens, miners are really going to be hurting because their profits are going to get cut in half. Now, as John pointed out on the show yesterday, there are ways for them to find systems, methods to reduce their costs. And obviously, electricity being one of the, the biggest factors there, find ways to get cheap electricity. If you look at what Bukele is doing down in El Salvador, phenomenal. That's great. He's doing geothermal. He's, he's using the, the volcano there to power the equipment for mining Bitcoin. So his cost is just building the infrastructure. There's no cost really because the, it's just the heat's there. Um, for electricity users, that's a problem, right? If I'm, if I'm running Marathon or Riot in an area that is, I just have a grid to work from, I could be driving prices up, I could be taxing that grid and, and really straining it and that's bad for infrastructure. But if you can use um, you know, methane, excess methane that's blow off from some of the refineries, that could save you some money. Uh, a lot of different things they could be doing to reduce costs, setting up hydroelectric or alternative energy methods to reduce their costs, that would help them. But unless they find a way to reduce their cost, they'll end up losing money because the price of Bitcoin or the amount of Bitcoin rewarded gets cut in half. So either Bitcoin doubles in price and things stay the same, or uh, these, these guys are going to lose money. But yeah, it's political. So now you have you know, a 30% tax on, on the cryptos held there. That's obviously going to be bad for Riot, Marathon. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure why Biden wanted to go after that. You can probably thank Elizabeth Warren for that one as well. But we'll see. I don't know if that's necessarily going to get approved. Yeah, all there is is just for politicians to get in. Well, yeah, it's a kind of a strange move. Remember, he's got to raise money somewhere. He's got, to, he's got to find ways to, to bring in more money. And of course, going after that is one way to do that. My concern is, I th well, not concern, but I think one of the, the, the short-sightedness here is, again, you have a lot of voters and a lot of people who are pro-digital assets and, and may vote for policies that are pro-crypto. And if you're elected official, even if it's in your political party, again, I am... You know, I, I, I don't have a loyalty to Democrats or Republicans, to Libertarians, Independent. I go with who I think is going to do the best job. I, I really don't care for the whole, um, you know, wave the party flag. That doesn't mean anything to me. It, it's really about who's going to do the best thing. I'll vote with that as being one of my factors. Of course, I've got a list of other things that are important to me, as all of you do. Uh, but that is one I will be voting with. And, you know, the current administration is starting to really lose my my vote with their actions with the SEC, with uh, you know, stonewalling these approval of Bitcoin ETFs and Elizabeth Warren just off a rocker. You might notice that a lot of prominent crypto individuals have been really funding the campaign for the guy who's running against her who's pro-crypto. So I think that's great. Garbage using El Salvador or crypto miners are... Uh, I, that's some of it, but they'd have a full germ geothermal Bitcoin mining operation. They're building the whole operation on, on the old volcano to generate the heat, therefore reduce cost. Kathy was another funds bought up shares, which SoFi is plenty of cash. Oh, you're, you're back on a SoFi again. Where's Michael's initial line? <laughs> you're back on SoFi. Um, look, I don't. Just because someone buys something does not mean I believe in it. If you look at um, NYCB, right? New York Community Bank Corp. You had all oh, Mnuchin and a group of investors came in with a billion dollars to help bail these guys out and save them. Well, that does not mean that I'm going to buy NYCB. I am not going to touch it. Um, 
Just the fact that a group came in with a billion dollars to help bail it out does not mean it's turned the corner and going to survive. Remember, you had billions of dollars poured into First Republic as well, and they ended up failing, right? It was J.P. Morgan came in, and, and, and I think it was $30 billion they put into First Republic. $30 billion. It was some crazy number like that, and then they ended up buying all the assets anyway, so it kind of saved them uh, in that whole process. But just because Mnuchin or somebody buys something does not mean it is a, a sure thing and safe. Uh, can we tap into Old Faithful and Yellowstone? What's funny, Mike, is... Old Faithful, <laughs> I, I I apologize for the crude statement, but I remember when I went to visit Old Faithful, I saw these images of Old Faithful with, you know, this 100-foot geysers, and like, wow, that's cool. I went there, and I, I have a camcorder. This is 20 years ago, and I'm recording Old Faithful, and it, everyone's, like, crowded around, and it went off, and it was so disappointing from the, the, the sheer pressure. I was like, I think my comment on camera was, wow, I could piss higher than that. It was that weak. So... I'm sure they could, Mike, but they would never do Old Faithful simply because it's such a historic tourist attraction. And it's cool. Old Faithful Lodge, that uh, Yellowstone Lodge, it's, Yellowstone's okay. Uh, if you want a really a beautiful park, uh, Glacier National Park is, is much better. It's much more wild. Um, whereas Yellowstone, Yellowstone is like the ride at Disney with the car that as a kid you think you're driving, but you can turn the wheel, but there's a concrete divider between you that you know, you, you stay on the rails. You really can't do much at Yellowstone. I, I was not that um, attracted to it. However, you do understand that it's, they call it the super volcano. That whole Yellowstone area is a giant volcano. And could they go off to points that aren't tourist attractions and set up geothermal? Absolutely. Uh, and they should. I feel like watching Joe versus the volcano. Uh, what else do I got here? Malik. Uh, hey, good to see you as well. Uh, Trump switches view on Bitcoin in the last couple of days to neutral-ish. Yeah. Trump will say whatever it is that will get him more votes. Period. It's like he'll look at the population and say, oh, 51% of people love Bitcoin and 49% hate it. Okay, I'm bullish on Bitcoin. If it was the other way around, I'm embarrassed on it. I, I, I hate it. Whatever will get you the more votes, he will. that's what he will say. We'll see if there's action. You know, now Vivek, who uh, I think would probably end up being his running mate. I don't know if that's been decided. I really, I'll be honest, I don't follow the politics. I try not to watch those debates. I hate the debates. I figure it's, it's it, for me, it's embarrassing as an American to watch those debates, watch just old men bicker about things. It's like, let's just, how about we compliment each other on what we do right and say, I'm the better person because I'm going to do this and this and this. Not, that guy sucks. He's bad. He's terrible. He's a loser. He, I hate him, blah, blah, blah. Ugh. It's like all of our elections have turned into just a bickering match of hatred as opposed to, hey, you know, they're good people as well, but I think I can do a better job because I'm doing this and this and this and this. Let my actions show you that I'm a better person for the job as opposed to my acidic words. Ugh. Unless it comes to, you know, guy out of Chicago that I can't stand. Just hope he disappears. Um, let's see. Uh, so I got that one. I talked about the Bitcoin contracts. Um I was going to bring up the economic data for today. Here is your CPI numbers. You guys have all seen this. We went from 3.1 to 3.2, which is nothing dramatic, but it is showing at least stabilization at this level. And this is against what the Fed has been saying. The Fed is saying we're seeing consistent declines. We want to see this continue down to 2%, which is where my cursor is down here, right there. Well, the fact of the matter is we're traversing sideways and stabilizing and basing right around that 3.2 to 3.3%. That's not good for... Um, a rate cut argument. If we continue to stay there, they may actually jump rates. I think that they'll wait and wait and wait and wait. And if it doesn't continue to drop down, then they'll raise rates again. But uh, that that's all something that will be determined later on this year. So we did have a higher tick of inflation than was expected. You look at some of the other numbers, it was pretty much all CPI related today. Uh, and you had your 10-year bond auction, which showed that yield increase as well. Now, as far as tomorrow goes, let me bring up and show you the economic calendar there. Bum, 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 bum. It's for Wednesday. GDP numbers coming out for the UK. They're expected to get back into positive territory at 2%. Uh, let me go past the big dip here we saw with the COVID piece. Notice that the UK has really just been oscillating above and below zero. So this is not really anything that's noteworthy, uh, you know, being positive because they've been positive like it seems like every other month here. Just chip, 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 chip. And let me go to other news for tomorrow. Getting down to the bottom where the US stuff is. You just have crude oil inventories. That's pretty much it. And 30-year bond auctions. Shelter. Oh, yeah, you know what? I didn't bring that one up. Thank you, Big Ab. I, I meant to bring that up today, showing um, 
where the, the inflation was the high, where, where do we see the biggest impacts of inflation? Maybe I'll bring it up tomorrow. I just don't have time to go dig for it right now, but um, it was interesting. So rent was number two. Uh, number one was, God, what was number one? It was something that, damn, damn it. It's, it's, it, it skipped me. Mike says, um, we were talking about Chicago and apparently the Bears are going to stay in Chicago and get a dome stadium, right? See, I've never understood why they never had a dome to begin with. Like, why do you, Why does Green Bay, why does Chicago, why do the, the Patriots all have an open air when you know it's going to snow and be colder than all heck at certain times of the year? Yet Arizona gets themselves a dome because what's you can't play in the heat, but you can play in the cold. I don't know, crazy. All right, so that's it for your, your economic calendars. Let me bring up your earnings calendar for tomorrow. I'm going to wrap this bad boy up since you guys got a bonus show yesterday with John, o John Talk A Lot O'Donnell. Uh, as far as earnings for today, you did have Kohl's stores report, and there also was another retailer in here. Hold on a second. Uh, who was the other one? Oh, I just got Kohl's, the one that's showing up. But Kohl's had great earnings, beat earnings. And tomorrow, your earnings numbers are... Didn't want to do it that way, but I, these are all international. Um, Lennar. Lennar is one that I'm very interested in. See how home builders are going to do. You have Lennar, Dollar Tree, you've got Hyundai, but most of these guys are international and not that big of a deal. So let's go look at Lennar real quick, and then I'll wrap this show up for today. Lennar. Get ready for my trivia night. Clearly, home builders are doing well. Right? Lennar was at 104 bucks back in November of last year and currently trading at 166 So it's been a great run for them, especially if you – continue back into mid 2022 when they were down to around 60 bucks so it's been a great run the only real sell-off we had was back here in um july of 2023 sold off just a little bit here so all in all looking pretty darn good uh, i saw the headline about the chiefs game resulting in a record number of amputations really of fans man i love football i'm a huge fan of football I'm not losing an arm. I'm not losing a pinky over football. I was in my living room with 72 degree temperatures, a 12 pack of beer, and all the food that I could eat. Now, no way am I losing limbs for a sport. <laughs> oh, man. Crazy. Anyway, guys, that's going to do it for me. Uh, I want to thank uh, Todd for your question on the YouTube channel and for those who would ask me about uh, things that were unique. Uh, more, some of you have been asking more and more, like, could you give us more specific stock recommendations? I'm not going to do that. I'm not here to say uh, to buy this or sell that. But I think today's show is definitely eye-opening with regards to ARM and the, just the sheer amount of shares that really are high probability of coming onto the marketplace. And if, if the market gets flooded with supply like that, then price is most likely is going to drop. So I'll let you know whether I um, send out a or make a trade on that one. I might, I might uh, just, we'll see. I, I, I will make a trade. I'm just not sure which one yet. I'll let you guys know an upcoming show. So uh, tomorrow is just me. If you have questions, comments, things you want me to discuss, you as you've seen, I do whatever you guys would like. Well, for the most part, uh, send in your requests to tradermerlin at gmail.com or put them down below any of the YouTube videos, and I will see you all tomorrow. Take care, everybody.